The Kundal History Prize is one of the best history prizes in the world. It is a great way to find some new books you've not heard of before, some of the very best books of history being written today. And I've reviewed a couple of uh, previous Kundal History Prize winners on the channel previously, including indeed interviewing a former jury member of the Kundal History Prize, Marie Pavarot. And the Kundal History Prize has only a few days ago in August 2024 announced its long list for this year's prize. 13 books in search of a curious reader. And it is a wonderful way to get some ideas for your reading list uh, that are not just histories of your country or old traditional styles of history, but are uh, histories about the whole world and and that show you some of the new, exciting and different ways in which history has been written today. Now, the, I'm Jeff Rich and this is The Burning Archive. And on this channel, I do talk about history and geopolitics and culture, talk about the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I also try to do some uh, reviews for you of leading historians and some of the best books you can read on some of the controversial topics that are making themselves felt in history today. And uh, this uh, long list this year from the Kundal History Prize is really on the money in terms of the topics and themes of the Burning Archive channel. The judge or the chair of the jury uh, uh, that um, decides on the prize, in announcing the prize, the long list for the prize, uh, has said that this is a long list which showcases the very best that's being written in history with topics from around the world and stretching over immense lengths of time. And it really is around the world, from all around the world. It's not just America. It's not just Britain. Uh, it's not just China or any one particular country. It's often topics that cross those uh, boundaries. And he says, we move from Indonesia to Central America to the liberation struggles of Congo, from a long-range history of indigenous peoples in North America, to court life in Mughal, India, to the legacy of wartime France. He also comments on the relevance of these issues to current-day concerns, the ties that bind slavery to capitalism, how guns and gun culture shape American society, and uh, the role of war, war trials, and international law, war guilt, including, of course, in a wartime France. Now, I have not read any of the 13 books on this list yet, but I have checked them out over the last couple of days, and will give you a brief introduction uh, just to whet your appetite uh, for them. And at the end of the video, I've got some questions for you uh, about which ones you would like me to look at in more detail, dive deeper into here on the Burning Archive. So here is the list in alphabetical order. Now, Gary J. Bass uh, he wrote a uh, Judgment at Tokyo, World War II on Trial and the Making of Modern Asia. Uh, and I should say all the links to the sort of Amazon, um, at least, versions of these books are in the, um, in, the, uh, in the video description below. I myself um, will also be trying to check out some of these books in public libraries, uh, State Library of Victoria and University Libraries, that sort of thing because uh, my uh, YouTube uh, income doesn't quite allow me to buy all four, 13 books from the Kundal History Prize. Uh, so Judgment at Tokyo by Gary uh, uh, J. Bass tells the story of the trial of Japan's uh, World War II time leaders as war criminals. It's a kind of... I guess the Asian version of the Nuremberg, later Nuremberg trials from the 1950s. 
And these trials happened over two years with lawyers from um, uh, both sides, America, really, I guess, in Japan, uh, and judges from China, India, the Philippines, and Australia, as well as from the US and other European powers. Uh, and it brought up a complex range of issues. I guess the Nuremberg trials are well known for the complex issues they rose, uh, they brought up. Uh, but this particular trial also seems to have left lingering um, divisions between China, Japan and Korea. It's not a story I know at all well, and I am quite intrigued to read this story. Gary Bass is a professor of politics and international law, and debates about war trials continue to affect us all today. Uh, Lauren Benton, they called it peace, worlds of imperial violence. Uh, now, this tells the history of how Im uh, uh, imperial viol violence practiced by empires uh, in the past made perpetual war and... Um, and atrocities, massacres, uh, common features of the international order. It's a very interesting and innovative idea. Rather than just look at the big walls between the major powers, as so much international relations does, as so much, uh, I guess, big history of the rise and fall of empires does, it looks at the role of the small walls, the proxy walls, the... Um, the internal divisions within societies and how they actually related to the power structures of those empires. It is uh, covers a long period of time from the 15th to the 20th century. I'll be really intrigued to read this book, um, both because it, I think it will be a really interesting complement to John Darwin's book After Tamerlan, The Rise and Fall of Global Empires. Uh, but also the whole role of small wars, small proxy wars, all that sort of thing continues to haunt international politics to this day as we're discovering, even as I speak, in both uh, Ukraine and Africa and in uh, West Asia. The third book on the list is by Joya Chatterjee, uh, Shadows at Noon, the South Asian 20th Century. Uh, now, this book uh, changes the standard narrative uh, of how uh, the um, South Asian countries, the former constituent parts of the British Empire in India, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, which formed in difficult ways after World War II, after 1947, uh, partition and all that sort of stuff and the subsequent war in Bangladesh, uh, how these, um, these uh, countries um, formed and what their character and shape was. Uh, and the author says the aim of the book is to make contemporary South Asia intelligible. And that is something I, I'm really curious about because uh, the whole India-Pakistan issue, the role of India, and even as I speak, there are some very difficult events going on right now in Bangladesh with riots and I think the leader of the country fleeing the country. Uh, uh, but this book also seems to take an innovative approach. It's not the usual sort of chronologically ordered account of period A and period B, but rather it takes a thematic approach and uh, helps talk. It actually talks explicitly to the lay reader rather than an academic expert about the character of nationalism and migration and consumption and how those changed over time, uh, especially with you know, the rising role of India in world affairs, the significant role of Pakistan in the emerging events in West Asia, and the, um, the concerning events, I guess, in Bangladesh over the last few weeks. Uh, I'll definitely be looking up this book and having a good read of it.
Kathleen Duval, Native Nations, a millennium in North America. And now this is a fascinating book. Uh, It's another in a whole series of uh, works coming out of America, which are sort of rewriting the history of, you know, the American Indians, the Native Indigenous Nations of America. Uh, And uh, in particular, um, this book explores how they used their power, how they functioned as, you know, effective, powerful states, these, you know, tribes, um, how they uh, 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 functioned as effective, powerful states with uh, different levels of sovereignty and influence of the uh, Native people of America, Indigenous people of America. For example, she looks at how the Mohawks, and I had no, I mean, I had a broad idea that, uh, especially having talked to Marie Favreau uh, about her work on the Mongol Empire and how it related to, uh, related work on the power of nomad empires and Felipe Fernandez Amesto's interesting work on Native America as well. I... I uh, had no idea about these specific things, but the Mohawks closely controlled trade with Dutch, uh, with the Dutch, and influenced global markets. The Kapoors, and sorry if I mispronounce anything, manipulated French colonists. Uh, the Shawnee forged a whole series of alliances. The Cherokees created institutions that operated with sovereignty on the global international political stage. You know, we talk about the Westphalian political order, but there was uh, a different aspect of international order happening there. And the Kiwas also uh, effectively uh, regulated the passage of white settlers across the country as the, you know, the the whole sort of, you know, wagons uh, crossing to, to settle the parts of Central and Western America happened through the 19th uh, century particularly. Absolutely intriguing book. I'm really curious about this one too, because again, it's flipping our understanding of different forms of political order, different forms of international order in a really interesting way. And also telling the story of the United States of America in a very, very different way. It's not all just about independent Americans and the Imperial British. It's a much more complicated story. Than Amitav Ghosh, uh, Smoke and Ashes, Opium's Hidden Histories. Now, this is uh, Am- Amitav Ghosh. Is, I think he's a fiction writer. He's a very varied writer. He's a bit of a man of letters, a uh, person of letters in today's terms. And um, uh, Smoke and Ashes, uh, similarly, is not a... Uh, a typical academic history as most of the previous ones, uh, you know, single genre sort of history as most of the previous ones uh, uh, were. Smoke and Ashes mixes travelogue, memoir and history. Uh, and I don't know why, but Amitav Gosh apparently has done decades of archival research on this topic, perhaps together with his other fictions. And he explores the extraordinary effect the opium trade had on Britain, India and China and the wider world, including the United States. A few famous wealthy American families had their fortunes established through the opium trade. Uh, This one will be uh, intriguing to explore, though, to be honest, uh, I, I do hope that a fiction author doesn't win the Kundal History Prize. I hope it's a proper, proper historian, the, not that we want to sort of keep it to the guild. Catherine Hall, uh, Lucky Valley, Edward Long and the History of Racial Capitalism. Now, this is on a topic um, that I don't know a lot about, but it's super, super important, the whole relationship between race and capitalism over time. And it is a it, it looks in detail, and again, this is a different way of writing history. It looks in detail at a particular individual who wrote a particular book that sort of 
symbolise a whole social set of social attitudes. That book is by Edward Long. It was The History of Jamaica. It was written in 1774, and uh, it... um, It was a highly cultured version of history that nonetheless sought to define white and black as essentially different and unequal. Um, You know, racism has not been like a a uniform attitude over time. It has changed and developed and I guess responded to different articulations. And so this is a really intriguing story about um, uh, about that, and of course, Jamaica, a huge slave trade, Afro, you know, part of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, sort of found its way into Jamaica, uh, a British colony. Brilliant, fascinating thing, and and it it brings uh, together. It helps define the mentality, I guess, of uh, people of this order. Helps us understand. Uh, their view, not with uh, an aim to endorse it, but to genuinely understand it. So this sounds a really interesting book. Julian Jackson, France on Trial, uh, The Case of Marshal Patan. Now, if you don't know, Marshal Patan was the sort of leader of France, of Vichy France, that is the the uh, the, the the part of France the, the sort of remnant French government, if you like, that collaborated with uh, the German government during the uh, German occupation of France in World War II. Uh, and uh, after, at the end of the war, Marshal Patan was, you know, put on trial, part of a war trial. Uh, quite a few people uh, were tried after the war. Some people were executed. Uh, and Julian uh, Jackson, uh, again, this is another case of a sort of slightly uh, different way of writing history because he takes this event, this three-week trial, uh, as a lens through which to examine a key crisis in 20th century French history. Why they were defeated in 1940, um, why an armistice was signed, why... Um, the Vichy government chose to collaborate, and not just the Vichy government, but you know, large numbers of people in French society. I think uh, wasn't Francois Mitterrand much later revealed to have been, uh, to some degree, a collaborator in this re- regime. So there was a large spectrum of people involved in these events. Uh, but a very shameful part of French history, one that can be erased, and this book brings it out in a very interesting way. I will be uh, fascinated to explore this uh, book. It won't be the first one I get to, i got to say, um, uh, but I have just read through this period of World War II, uh, including looking at a few of famous French intellectuals who had different Perspectives on the Vichy collaboration, de Garde and André Gide and Albert Camus, Jean-Paul Sartre, in my Nobel's uh, literature series. So do check that out also uh, 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 after this video, if you like. Uh, the next book is by Patrick Joyce, Remembering Peasants, A Personal History of a Vanished World. Now, in this new history of peasantry, Patrick Joyce tells the story of this lost world of uh, the lost world and its people. I mean, uh, even up until, I guess, the early 19th century, a very, very large proportion of the world's population were peasants. And part of the, I guess, the traumas and the the nature of the social change associated with industrialisation, urbanisation, uh, Etc. Uh, was the the, um, the 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 change in the nature of work, the change in the social structure, the change in the culture, with a big reduction in the size of the agricultural labor labor workforce, the peasantry, uh, and um, and other types of occupations. 
and it is a lost world. I mean, I don't know the worldwide statistics, but the actual proportion of people who work in agriculture these days is very, very small. And Patrick Joyce uh, goes beyond usual sort of, you know, insulting stereotypes, you dumb peasant and all that sort of thing, and explores the rich, complex culture of traditions, songs, celebrations and revolts. Again, this is something which comes through in my Nobel uh, literature series. Quite a few of the uh, early Nobel Prize winners in the first 30 or 40 years of the 20th century um, uh, portrayed this rich culture of peasant life. Strahl and um, uh, Raymond and uh, others as well. Now, I'm not sure exactly how broadly international the coverage of the books is, um, but he certainly uh, looks at European uh, peasantry, Poland, Italy, Ireland uh, through the 19th century to the present day and combines individual stories, um, including uh, his own sort of experience of his Irish peasant family uh, and looks at both how uh, those people remember peasant life, how, I guess, historians and public memory remembers peasant life and how it... Um, persists with good images and bad images in the culture. I will be really interested to explore this book, partly because uh, this is one author on this list who I have read, Patrick Joyce, long, long ago, because Patrick Joyce used to write um, uh, books on the historical meanings of work, which happens to be really the... The topic or the subject of my PhD thesis. So I do remember reading Patrick Joyce uh, long, long ago, back in the 1980s. And uh, I'll be really, really interested to see this uh, sort of kind of, uh, I guess, masterpiece at the end of life that he's prepared. Ruby Lal, uh, Vagabond Princess, The Great Adventures of Gulbadan. And again, apologies if I haven't pronounced that right. Now, Gulbadan was a Mughal princess. Mughal, the sort of, you know, Muslim, um, um, you know, empire, I guess, that controlled most of India, certainly most of northern India, and into, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, I don't, can't remember if they went out to Bangladesh, but, uh, uh, um, you know, southern into Central Asia in the kind of, uh, well, for quite a long time, really, in, I think, I don't quite know when the Mughal period began, but um, this woman, uh, Princess Gulbadan, uh, uh, ended up as a uh, a member of the court of the harem of her nephew, uh, Emperor Akbar, who was one of the most important of the Mughal emperors in, uh, uh, let's just say, Indian history from the period, and he ruled in the period 1556 to 1605, now, this book is, again, a different kind of approach to history. It is a biography, and it's a biography based on a rare, precious document, um, which uh, the author has been able to recover from, uh, you know, people forgetting about it, uh, an actual memoir by Princess Gulbadan. So we have the rare, precious thing of the personally recounted stories of a, uh, a princess in the Mughal court of India. And she herself led a very interesting life, uh, migrating from, uh, you know, travelling, I guess, between Kabul, Agra and Lahore and ultimately ending up uh, at, some point in the harem of her nephew, uh, Emperor Akbar. Uh, now, Ruby Lal, I know I've read a little bit of one of another of her biographies of 
the intriguing women from South Asia. It's something she uh, seems to focus on or specialise in, and I'm really keen to follow this one up. Um, from memory, the, the previous book was brilliantly written, and this will be brilliantly written too, The Vagabond Princess, The Great Adventures of Gulbadan. Andrew McKevitt, uh, Gun Country, Gun Capitalism, Culture and Control in Cold War America. Now, if you know, apologies to people listening in America, but most of the world uh, looks upon America's gun culture and its gun laws and its, its sad, sad record of uh, gun violence and mass killing, um, you know, more guns than people, uh, with uh, horror and despair and some level of curiosity as to, well, how exactly did it get this way? And that is the question that Andrew McKevitt, to some degree, seems to address in this book. Um, it, 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 the summary says that after 1945, end of the Cold War, post-1945 world, um, uh Europe, and presumably also America, had large surpluses of mass-produced weapons. They had just thought, you know, fought uh, the you know the most lethal, one of the most, I think it is the most lethal war in human history. And um, American entrepreneurs took the opportunity to buy all these surplus guns in, you know, war-ravaged Europe short of uh, money, uh, buy them all, and then uh, resell them back in America. And hence, America was flooded with cheap guns. Rates of gun ownership and violence began to climb. And even uh, so, in this period, apparently there was, in response to this troubling development, and it would be a troubling development, uh, there were attempts to try to curb it and introduce gun laws, but the sort of consumer capitalist and Cold War ideologies of America got in the way and America became the gun culture, uh, you know, uh, that it is today, sadly. This is an intriguing story, absolutely intriguing story. I'll be really interested to uh, find out more about this book. Dylan Penning Groff, uh, Before the Movement, The Hidden History of Black Civil Rights. So this is a long history of black civil rights. It takes a different perspective to the usual standard perspective of, I guess, you know, Martin Luther King and the late developments in the 1960s and, you know, the buses and all that sort of thing. It certainly, no doubt, covers those things, but the basic um, story here is that uh, um, uh, African Americans were much more well informed about the law and involved in fighting back against these various discriminatory laws uh, for a much, much longer time than, I guess, the kind of uh, the popular history focus on the sort of 1960s civil rights movement would suggest. Indeed, it goes all the way back to slavery in uh, Dylan Penningroff's account. Fascinating thing, and again, a wonderful example of what different types of history can do because he's sort of scrounged around in all these sort of forgotten sources and basements of county courthouses. Uh, you know, little places in America to find all the records, the you know legal records, etc., which testify to the way in which there has been a long, long, long hidden history of black civil rights agitation and, and uh, activism. Fascinating book, and I guess also a great example of innovative use of historical do documents and primary sources. Well done, Dilling Penningroff. Okay, Stuart Reed, uh, the Lumumba pot, plot, the Lumumba plot, the secret history of the CIA in a Cold War assassination. Uh, so this story talks about events in the former 
Belgian Congo, um, you know, the place where Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness was set in the late 19th, early 20th century, a place of absolutely appalling human rights abuses. Uh, but in the late uh, 1950s, early 1960s, it was decolonising and a new government was forming in uh, civil rights. But decolonisation was, you know, tied up with the Cold War to some degree. Uh, the the decolonisation threatened the power of the combined American and European empires, which still possessed colonies well into the 1970s. Indeed, uh, in Britain's case, um, you know, I guess it's still got the Falklands Islands, hasn't it? But, you know, uh, Hong Kong was only uh, given back in uh, whatever it was, 1999 or 2000. And uh, so he describes the events of uh, that related to the sort of decolonisation, new independent government uh, of Congo, uh, which was led by a man called Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba, if I'm not uh, incorrect, but I'm just doing that from memory. Uh, and um, uh, they sort of formed uh, that they formed a new government, but there was a lot of civil strife, as there often was with, you know, the European powers sort of leaving behind a mess and not really helping all that much. And the United States and the Soviet Union and to some degree also China sort of um, prowling around the outside competing for geostrategic influence and access to the resources that were being exploited in these countries uh, and the people who were being exploited in these countries. Uh, so uh, uh, Lumumba got pretty frustrated with the way in which the United States was acting and sought help from the United Nations. They didn't help all that much either. Uh, and then he approached the Soviet Union to appeal for help. And, of course, this set made America crazy <laughs> or you know, angry. And as a result, the CIA uh, decided that this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, in order to prevent the spread of communism in Africa, Lumumba had to go. How often have we heard that phrase? Assad has to go. Putin has to go. All the rest of it. Maduro has to go. Uh, it was one of a very long, sad history of C American CIA interventions in affairs of other nations. It was a very tragic uh, event. It ultimately led to Lumumba's assassination, yeah, uh, as part of the Cold War uh, and created many difficulties for the people of Congo. Uh, and But for the United States, uh, it was part of the whole regime change playbook. Now, this is a fascinating history, so relevant to uh, topics I talk about on this channel. Only last week, I think I was chatting uh, with people on my live stream about um, whether there should be an international commission into the United States CIA and um, its various sort of interventions, the affairs of other sovereign states. The book is written by uh, Stuart A. Reid, who is... Um, apparently the executive editor of Foreign Affairs magazine. I don't think he's actually a historian. It will be interesting to do that. I've always got a little bit of wariness uh, with anything with those big uh, establishment foreign policy magazines out of the United States, but prepared to give it a go, especially if uh, it helps build the case for an international commission into the CIA. The last book on the list, David Van Raybrook, Revolusi, Indonesia and the Birth of the Modern World. Now, this tells the story of the birth of Indonesia between 1945 and 1949. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the difficult next 
20 or 30 years, really, as well. I'm not exactly sure what the coverage of is, but it's, again, a story of one of the most significant decolonizations in the modern world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world. It's Australia's closest neighbour. It is going to be a very, it's, you know, uh, 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 has enormous number of languages and islands and it is a, has a very rich and complicated history and a growing economy. So it's a really important country to understand and this book helps us do that. Uh, it talks about the difficult struggle, struggle of Indonesian independence that culminated with uh, in 1949, uh, the year NATO began, uh, uh, and uh, with the role of the UN, and uh, it draws on interviews and eyewitness testimony. So again, it's a different way of telling history. It's not just diplomatic documents and standard, you know, history. You know, just retelling the stories from other histories. And it says here that Revolusi is a landmark publication showing Indonesia's struggle for independence to be one of the defining dramas of the 20th century. Interestingly, um, Van Raybrook, David Van Raybrook, uh, is a Belgian cultural historian archaeologist and author. He writes historical fiction, literary non-fiction novels, poetry, plays and academic texts. So it will be interesting to see uh, how he has treated this. It sounds a little bit like not so much the standard academic history, but a really, really interesting topic. And I certainly want to get to this book at some point over the next year or so or over the next 12 months, uh, because Indonesia is an incredibly important place. And this whole story of decolonization and the formation of new nations and how it interacted with the conventional story of world order has been a big theme on the Burning Archive over the last couple of months and one I will be returning to. Let's just wrap up the topics then. We see the big range of topics here. War and peace, war, tri war trials, race, capitalism, uh, stories of important countries in the newly emerging world, hidden histories of uh, important, fascinating women of the civil rights movement in America, the backstory of regime change operations and America's problems with guns. Uh, and we see some different styles of history too. Biography, the sort of focused event like Marshall Patan's trial, big sweeping analysis over centuries, such as the book on uh, by, let me just remind myself of her name, Lauren Benton, the fascinating thematic rather than chronological history by uh, Joya Chatterjee and the sort of mixed genres, not just straight academic history, but like uh, Amitav Vargosh and the last chap as well. Uh, what was his name? David Van Raybrook. Uh, so uh, I, I, I've also noticed in this year's prize a bit of a shift from the Kundal History Prize um, Outside of the sort of traditional topics of the Anglo-American world and Western Europe, um, I think it's uh, they are to be commended with the breadth of range, the big focus on uh, uh, countries outside of the, I guess, the collective West. But if there are any historians out there watching, I'd love to know your suggestions for giving more prominence to uh, the history being written in countries other than the Britain and the United States and in languages other than, um, you know, um, other than English, you know. Uh, history is being written in contemporary India, in contemporary China, in Brazil and Russia and um, you know, the many other, in Indonesia itself. So I'd love to know if anyone has any suggestions about prizes or ways into 
and pick up those works a little bit more easily. But there are definitely some books here that I want to add to my reading list. I think definitely Benton and Chatterjee and Raybrook and Lal. Um, but I'd also love to know which ones you would like to read, uh, which ones interest you most. And let me know in a comment, particularly if that any of these books that you'd like to do a read along with me on or for me to do a video review of or even do an interview with the author of and I will follow them up. Um, I do owe uh, my viewers a review of one or two books from last year's list. I'm pretty sure I want to do a video on James Bellich's book on the Black Death, The Plague. Uh, but, uh, you know, a year or so ago, I interviewed Marie Favreau, the author of The Horde, How the Mongols Changed the World, How the Mongols Changed the World. And um, she was also a member of the jury of the Kundal History Prize last year. Uh, so uh, I would love to interview one of these authors too. So why don't you let me know in a comment? Um, whether you'd want to do a read-along with any of these books, me for, to do a video review of them, or me to do an interview with the author and just tell me what the book is and what you'd like me to do with it, and I will see if I can make it happen. And make sure you also subscribe to jeffrich.substack where you can get more information and more sort of written material on the, uh, you know, uh, making sense of this puzzling world with history. Why not just watch my uh, uh, interview with Marie Favreau, former member of the jury of the Kundal History Prize and uh, author of the Kundal History Prize nominated uh, excellent, excellent, excellent book, um, The Horde, How the Mongols Changed the World, right here.